So I, uh, I'm wearing three microphones. Can everybody hear me all right? Yep. I've never worn three independent microphones before. <laughs> this is a surreal experience. Well, thank you all for coming. I apologize in advance. I'm a bit jet lagged. I uh, just flew in from Colorado yesterday. It was uh, 25 hours of travel to get here to Singapore. I spoke this morning at the uh, Blockchain Summit. I have a meeting tonight at 3 a.m. and then I have to fly to Korea at 8 a.m. So it's a really long day. Um, anyway, I'll try to be cogent. And I'll try to give you guys a nice presentation about who I am and what I do and, and some of my thoughts on the industry as a whole. Uh, I like having long QA sessions. So my hope is to just keep going until either I collapse or you guys get tired of me or something in between. How does that sound for tonight? Pretty good? You guys lively? Had a good day? I noticed they've opened up the wine, so they should be really happy, right? Okay. So who am I? I'm Charles Hoskinson. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I run a company called IOHK. Uh, and what our company does is we're both a science and an engineering firm. So on the science side, we think about the science of cryptocurrencies. So we think a lot about things like what is a consensus protocol and what is zero knowledge cryptography and what does privacy mean? And uh, you know, how do we build incentive compatible systems? But we also think a lot about law and policy. So what do these systems actually mean to regulators and to governments? For example, what does it mean to own a Bitcoin? Does it mean custody of a private key or is there something more to that? And can a DAO ever own property? And these types of questions. So we do a lot of interesting things. We set up labs. So what we do is we hire professors and graduate students and postdocs and we actually embed them within universities. We have three labs, one's at Tokyo Institute of Technology, uh, one's at University of Athens, and one's at University of Edinburgh. Athens is nice, I get to go there and get some nice Greek food, set a lab up there. Uh, and we have uh, affiliations with probably a dozen other institutions all across the world, from Cambridge to Oxford to some US institutions and so forth. The research we do is peer reviewed. So we write papers just like any good academic will and we submit them to journals and conferences really good conferences like crypto and Eurocrypt and so forth that tend to accept less than 20% of papers that are submitted. On the engineering side, we actually build cryptocurrencies. Go figure, somebody has to get around to doing that, right? Apparently there's a lot of money in this space, but there's not a lot of good engineers in this space to actually know how to do things. So we made a strategic bet that uh, supply would be much smaller than demand. And that bet worked out for me. My co-founder and I started the company back in 2015, uh, and we've grown from two people to 160 people and nine figures of revenue. And my co-founder and I own the company ourselves, so no venture capitalists. We just kind of do whatever the hell we want to do. Now, why was I in a position to do this and self-fund? Well, because I'm a co-founder of Ethereum, and I've been in the cryptocurrency space since 2011. So I've watched this space go from basically nothing in fact, my very first cryptocurrency meetup group was in Denver, Colorado. Two people registered, it was me and another guy, and I was the only one to show up. So I had a very lovely conversation with myself about how magical Bitcoin is. So the space has changed a little bit. You know, so thank you all for coming. It's actually kind of humbling to see how fast the cryptocurrency space has gone from just a bunch of people having fun to an actual Goliath, $500 billion industry with a lot of interesting innovation going on. So that's a bit about my background. So what do we do? What do we think about? What's the point of all of this? So in 2011, when I first started doing things in the cryptocurrency space, there really was not much to do. You could mine, you could try to buy Bitcoin. Back then you'd buy it on spreadsheets or from really shady exchanges or really shady people that would meet you in parking lots. It was like, am I buying Bitcoin or drugs? I'm still not sure what I'm doing. So it was a very strange industry back in those days, and a very small, very close-knit industry, and people all kind of knew each other and each other's dirty laundry and so forth. Uh, and over time, what happened was that we went from this shady, strange industry of a bunch of fire brands, and we all kind of didn't believe that this was gonna be big, to a professionalized industry with billions of dollars of capital. The problem is you still couldn't do anything with cryptocurrencies. Uh, so, you know, you had an issue where you'd like to say, hey, I'll give you $100 if you mow my lawn. It's a simple transaction, right? Yeah, you can understand that. Can't do that with Bitcoin. That's super difficult to do. I like these hand mics. Wanna, uh, it's my mic flip. It's my standard thing I do. Thank you. So anyway, 
uh, you'd like to do something simple like $100 to mow my lawn. Great. Well, how do you know they actually mow the lawn? How do you figure that out? Well, it's a contingent settlement transaction. You have to kind of figure out the if then, and you have to designate somebody to decide whether the lawn's been mowed or not. And at the end of the day, it's basically like a contract. So in 2013, Vitalik Buterin and others were thinking about this concept and Vitalik was smart enough to write it down on a paper. And I was one of the earliest people to join that project. And we built Ethereum as kind of our first attempt to try to solve that problem of how do we get to the process of writing commercial relationships down in code and make them self-enforcing. So basically put a programming language on top of a blockchain. Uh, and that was fun. We didn't think Ethereum was going to be that big. We would have designed it differently and we would have built a different legal structure and probably treated each other a little differently had we known that Ethereum was going to grow the way it grew. Uh, but now it is where it's at. The industry's grown up and we've gotten to a point where we can now do very complicated transactions. We've gotten to a point where you can now do really interesting things. But the problem is you can't do them at scale. Think about a company like BP. How many sensors do you guys have? You know, just one refinery. How complicated is such a thing? You know, just a global logistics system, tracking where your entire inventory is or where people are for a multinational company. One company, just one of the majors, not even the largest. You would destroy anything that I ever built in my life. Yet, we're somehow asserting in the space that blockchain technology is going to transform your industry. So there's a bit of a mismatch between the promise and the capabilities of these systems. They don't operate at scale. Second, even if they did operate at scale, how do standards work? Are we all interoperable? Can you move information and value between these systems? No, you can't yet. Could you imagine how horrible of an experience Wi-Fi would be if every time you go to a different country, they have a different Wi-Fi standard and your cell phone can't connect, your iPad can't connect? That would just be horrible. Wi-Fi wouldn't work. It would be the most miserable experience in the world. What's well, around Bitcoin technology, blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies? There are 1,500 of them. They don't talk to each other. They're all blind, deaf, and dumb for the most part. So we have an interoperability problem. It's a scale problem, an interoperability problem. Now, has anybody here heard of Bitcoin Cash? Has anybody here heard of Ethereum Classic? Okay. Yeah, so what are those? Well, those are forks where apparently somebody wanted to go left and somebody wanted to go right, and they couldn't agree. And guess what happened? They split the ecosystem. So you can't go with a straight face and say, we're going to change the entire world money system. Oh, and by the way, the minute we have a disagreement, something as significant as I want to go from one megabyte blocks to larger blocks, we're going to cleave your money into two and everybody's going to hate each other for the rest of life and make clever memes on the internet. So we have a governance problem, right? Then we also have a money problem in that who pays to maintain these systems? BP builds something, BP pays for it. work? How about now? There we go. So if BP pays for something, BP, pay, you know, if they build it, they pay for it. Pretty simple, right? If something goes wrong, you're liable for it. Pretty simple, right? That's the way the world currently works. But when you go to cryptocurrency space, you say, oh no, it's decentralized. No one's liable. No one's going to pay for it. Just beneficent volunteers will wake up and fix your problems and your entire economy, your health care, your privacy, all of these things will rely upon the beneficence and goodwill of engineers who often disagree and when they do, they'll fork the system. That's the model that our space is proposing. So we're not quite out of that second generation and into the third generation where we have legitimate solutions where I, with a straight face, can look at you guys and say, yes, this is going to change everything. But just like the Internet in the 1980s, we all kind of know this thing's a big idea. Because reality is, for the first time in human history, we are having a reasonable conversation about a common financial surface for everybody. See, inter the Internet brought this idea that you can move information to everybody in the world instantaneously. It's a pretty magical concept if you think about it. When I was growing up, when I wanted to get a book, I had to go to the library, get on a bicycle, and drive there, often in the rain, because I grew up in Hawaii and it rained all the damn time. And people love driving drunk at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And so not only did I have to dodge the cars with drunk drivers and the dogs, because no one ever put their damn dogs on leashes, but I also had to, you know, get really wet and put my books in a bag as a six-year-old. I was a really weird six-year-old. And then drive my bicycle back. That's the cost of moving information for me in that book. 
And then suddenly the damn internet comes around. These kids that grow up today, they get it for free instantaneously. They just click a button and now they can read anything that they want from their Kindle. So a corollary to this is if we can move information at the speed of light, we should be able to move money at the speed of light. We should be able to very easily convert one form of value into another form of value. Why the hell, when everything is just data, do we look at stocks and bonds and commodities and property and all these other things as so different that they have to be traded on different exchanges by different people with different processes? They're all basically the same, it's just different representations of value. So why shouldn't we have a global market to trade these things? Why shouldn't we have a market that allows you to go from one to another easily? Why in this day and age do we really care about our national currencies, if you think about it? It's like I, I live in America, but I've traveled over 50 countries the last three years. And everywhere I go, I use my credit card uh, if I can use it. And I'm paying in dollars. Is the dollar the national currency of Singapore? No. What about Germany? No. What about the UK? No. But somehow, some way, the merchant just takes my transaction. Are they taking dollars? No. There's all this financial infrastructure in the backdrop that's allowing me to go from what I have to what they want. So if we abstract that a little bit, why do I need to store my wealth in dollars? Why can't I have a portfolio of things and I can just have tokens representing interesting things like gold and silver and cryptocurrencies and property? And I can just go anywhere I want and start buying things with these crazy tokens. Like what if I want to pay you guys in silver tokens? Would you take it? No. Would you take dollar? Sure. Would you care if there was somebody in the middle of that trade who did it on your behalf? And if the transaction fee is really low, would I care about it? No. And that's the world we're moving towards. This is what the promise of cryptocurrencies is really about. When you move all the fluff and the marketing and the centralized this and the decentralized that, we really are moving to a world of universal markets, universal flow of value and having deep and extremely rich conversations about how we should reconstruct the world financial system in a way that includes all 7 billion people. And in a way that puts you guys basically in control of your entire financial life. We all grew up in a system where most of our financial decisions were made for us. How our money works, how the banking system works, the payment rails we send value on, we didn't decide that, we inherited that. And those things were created by people no brighter than any of us at conferences like the Bretton Woods Accords, usually on the back of a global conflict or the collapse of a country. And they said, well, we need to fix this. So we'll just uh, we'll just adopt this and we'll go with it until something better comes along. And then 70 years later, it's like, why did we do this? Well, I, it seemed like a good idea at the time and everybody's doing it now. So we can't change the damn thing. And guess what? Now we do. So that's actually the real value of the cryptocurrency space. When you pull all the marketing out and all the capabilities out is it's a very young movement where a bunch of crazy people got together and they realized that all the things we have in life are social fictions. They're constructions that we agree to believe in out of necessity. Companies don't exist. Money doesn't exist. Property doesn't exist. These are things that we agree to have exist because we realize that if we agree to have these things exist, life gets better. It allows us to go from the caves to have society. If you know that the law is there, you can trust people. If you know that your money is there, you can coordinate with people. Somebody comes up to you and gives you a piece of paper with a dead person on it and says, do something for this. The only reason you take that is because you think that's worth something. But is there a physical reason it's worth something? No. But the imagination that it is is what compels you and compels you to show up for work and compels you to do things that you never thought you would do. So somebody a long time ago created that fiction for society to work. And what cryptocurrencies are doing is they're pulling the curtain that the wizard's hiding behind and telling us that we're now able to write our own fictions. I created a money that's worth $50 billion. I'm just a dude who grew up in Hawaii, who likes books. I'm not special, I'm not trained. I wasn't elected to any office, but I did that. I did it again with Cardano, I'll do it again. And you guys could too. That's the point of the cryptocurrency space. That's where we come from, that's who we are. And it's not just about the money, it's not just about the value, it's about much more fundamental things like commercial relationships, about identity, about reputation. Who are the good people? Who are the bad people? We have an office in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia 
right now in deep discussions about how are we going to model the supply chain of the coffee industry. Something as simple as that. It's a tremendously rich and complicated problem. On one side of the chain, you have a super high-tech government-controlled exchange built by Stanford grads and MIT engineers. Brilliant piece of work. On the other side of the coffee supply chain, you have a million and a half farmers, most of which who don't have electricity and most of which who don't have internet. And how do they find price discovery for their washing stations to sell their beans? Through text messages. They send them to people and they say, hey, how much can I get for this? And they find a good price, they put the beans on the back of a donkey and they ride to the place. That's the supply chain they have. And then just the act of modeling that, you're all of a sudden creating digital identities, for that million and a half people. You're all of a sudden understanding how all these things are moving and you're in a position where you can start giving people credit, talking about reputation, who are the good actors, the bad actors, and all these investment opportunities just materialize almost magically out of this process. For example, there's a, something you can do called stumping. The hell's stumping? You cut down a coffee tree. It regrows. Coffee trees do that and it produces 200% to 300% more coffee if you stump an old tree. Now, why don't farmers do this? Because they're poor, and if they cut their trees down, they can't eat because they make no money. But if somebody pays them to stump the trees, and they can have a bridge of capital there while they wait for the trees to regrow, that's a mutually beneficial agreement, isn't it? Something as simple as that. Why can't you do it? There's no way to get the money to them. There's no way to enforce the agreement. There's no way to track the excess production and be able to claim some of that to make a profit from the lend. But if you had modeled the supply chain, you could do that. So very simple example of how do we just follow the bean from the farmer to the cup of coffee could allow us to literally redefine how people live in a country like Ethiopia and by extension everywhere else in the world. And none of this requires government consent. None of this requires permission. You can just go and do it as it has been done in Kenya and as it has been done throughout many places in the world. And that's really the magic of what we're doing in our space. There's a lot of nuances and magic. Uh, you know, there's permission ledger, permissionless ledger. There's tons of nomenclature. There's a lot of things we have to figure out. You know, like how do we build good consensus protocols for these things? Because it turns out that we don't know how to do that yet. How much privacy should we have? You know, how much mutability should we have in the ledger? You know, when is it okay to throw things away? What do you do with metadata? It's a very rich field, and it's why I love it so much, because no matter how much I learn, there's more to do. But at the end of the day, it's all about people and all about stories and all about perceptions and faith and confidence. So uh, that's what my space is all about. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation for you guys to, to listen to me, and now I get to listen to you. So I'd love to get your questions, and I hope we have a very lively Q&A. Thank you. Okay, here we go. This is the question that came in so far in voting. Okay. So uh, seven votes for the top left corner, and then we just kind of go through. Okay, any relation between Cardano, Emergo, and Hyperledger? Uh, so Emergo and Cardano are, in, well, okay, there's three core entities in the Cardano ecosystem. There's IOHK, Cardano Foundation, and Emergo. Uh, Emergo is kind of like Cardano Foundation, Cardano's version of consensus. So if you look at the development of a cryptocurrency, there's somebody who has to build it, there's somebody who has to kind of be like a standards body and a community manager and trademark holder because there is some initial IP that you have. And then there's somebody who has to encourage people to use which has been built. Now you can compress all these things into a single organization, but you do have conflicts of interest. Like for example, if you're building both the protocol and as well as trying to encourage people to do things on top of it, you could bias the development of the protocol towards your own particular applications. So it's good to pull these apart into independent entities. So Emergo is the one that works at bringing people into Cardano. IOHK is a neutral entity. We build cryptocurrencies. We're not just working on Cardano. We work on many. Uh, and uh, the Cardano Foundation is a dedicated not-for-profit based in Switzerland that's responsible for being kind of the neutral. Now, the other question was, what is the relationship with Hyperledger? Uh, there is no relationship with Cardano and Hyperledger. There is a relationship 
with the fabric guys and IOHK. So IOHK has a research division um, and that research division has a Cypriot entity and we've received a grant with guard time and IBM research to study some decentralized software updating. Some of the scientists who work on that uh, also happen to work on the fabric project, Christian Cashin and a few others. And we have had discussions about taking Ouroboros, which is the heart of Cardano, and implementing Ouroboros into fabric as another option outside of just BFT simple. So we have a good relationship with these guys. They're great scientists, they're great engineers, and fabric is a great product. And we highly recommend people look to that as a standard bearer of quality for permission blockchains. But there's no direct relationship with Cardano project and Hyperledger. Yes. Answer for number five is you will be able to write smart contracts using JavaScript. How will we do that? Either by writing a compiler by hand from JS to Yella or by using semantic space compilation. Next question. You know, he didn't ask when, so I get the punt on that. Next question. All right, let's see what we got here. We're just doing with the highest voting. How can Cardano's POS system prevent centralization when whales and billionaires have so much money that they can buy tons of ADA and get majority and establish large stake pools? Okay, well, that's fair. So you have a plutocracy. And, you know, at the end of the day, you have to have somebody be in control of the system. And so the first question you ask is, do the custodians of the system care about the system thriving, growing, and surviving? Or are they mercenaries? So if you think about the Roman Empire, it's a great social experiment. For a long time, the Roman Empire was not an empire you messed with. Not only would they conquer you, they would like crucify anybody who opposed them. So why were they so fearsome? Because they had a very powerful military that was extremely carefully designed and balanced and with just the right incentives to care a lot about the preservation of the Roman state. Because the Roman system was good for the Roman soldier. Okay, then somewhere along the way, the dynamics changed and the soldiers went from citizens who were very vested with the system to mercenaries who really didn't give a shit about the Roman Empire. It was just how much money they could make. So the problem with mercenaries is they're not loyal. And when facts and circumstances change, they could be on the other side and sack you. And that's exactly what ended up happening. So when you construct a system where you rely on a group of people to maintain the system, you must think very carefully about, well, why should they care? So right now we have things like Bitcoin with proof of work. Why do they care? Because we pay them to care. And where do they get their power from? Meta, outside of the system, it's called exogenous. It's outside of the system, as opposed to endogenous, inside of the system. And it's mining equipment, mining hardware. Now, the first problem with proof of work is that that mining hardware can be used on more than one cryptocurrency. So let's say you have two cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrency A and cryptocurrency B, and they're roughly the same value and the same amount of mining is going on, and you have your mining equipment. Now you can make equal money mining one or the other. So do you care about A or B? No, it's, it's completely a moot point to you. So let's say you get a lot of mining power, enough to overtake one chain or the other. So now let's introduce another factor called derivatives. So what if you could short sell that chain? What if you could buy options to crash that chain? So then you have a perverse incentive to conduct what's called a Goldfinger attack. So what you do is you'd say, I'm going to short A, I'm going to double spend and destroy A, I'm going to DDoS it basically, shut that chain down. It's gonna destroy the faith and confidence in that chain. The market will collapse. I'll make a windfall profit on that. And then I'll take my miners and apply them towards chain B. And I'll just continue making money. So you now have an incentive using the very same army, the very same technology that kept your chains originally secure to now purpose it towards destroying one of the two chains because of the market dynamics. Can you do this with proof of stake? Well, not really, because the only way to get control of that system is to buy the tokens. And in the process of doing that, you're now destroying the tokens for the very system that you own. It's like saying, you can make good money by burning your own house down. Well, yes, you probably could make some insurance money for that, but you had to buy the house to begin with. And you're never going to cut even on that kind of a deal or that kind of transaction. Now, is this a completely fair system? No, it's biased towards the rich. 
But what system of governance in the world is not? Is the American election system egalitarian? Do poor people have just as much influence as George Soros and the Rockefeller family and large multinational corporations? No. The difference here is it's explicit. We know how much and what incentives are and they're tunable. And also you can eventually change the way POS works to elect people not just based upon how much stake that they have in the system, but by other qualitative metrics. Like imagine a fantasy metric, a usefulness metric, where you relay data, or you're a really good oracle, or you have a high reputation. And that could actually bias your chances of participating in consensus at the same or even greater levels than your stake itself. POS invites you to dream up of these metrics and gives you another dimension to try to tune systems properly. So in the beginning, you start with something very crude. If you own it, you probably care about it. It's a very reasonable starting assumption. And then later on, you gradually decide to add more nuance to your metrics. You start to add layer two, layer three considerations that can be just as meaningful as the, if you own it, you care about it notion. The difference is though, you're only invested in one system. You're not a mercenary who doesn't care about the system. Okay, and that's the philosophical difference. Now, reasonable people can disagree, which is why we have a diversity of consensus protocols in the system. We have proof of work, we have DPoS, we have Byzantine agreement. There's a lot of different ways you can do this, and that's why we have many different cryptocurrencies. So you vote with your wallet, you vote with your feet. Next question. We already answered the one about JS. Okay, let's do the next one. Could you please tell us about multi-ledger? How will you convince other blockchains to join your standard? Uh, the best way of doing that is to have your standard work in such a way that they don't even have to join it. Uh, so uh, the problem here is that interoperability is one of those problems of consensus rather than technological merit. So you can have a perfect way of doing it. That's just magical and beautiful and every possible way solves every problem and if nobody adopts it, tough cookies. The story of JavaScript is probably the greatest example of that. So JavaScript was this crazy wonky language that was designed in a very short period of time by a guy named Brendan Ick. It's kind of a clutch programming thing where the Netscape guy said, we need a scripting language, let's just get it done and let's get it done as quickly as we can. Nobody ever imagined that they would accidentally be designing the lingua franca of the entire internet. They never woke up and said, boy, I can't wait to curse every website, billions and billions and billions of people with, with my poor decisions. No, they just kind of stumbled into that role. And it's taken quite a bit of time to clean up JavaScript and make it somewhat reasonable. And now we're starting to converge to WebAssembly. So we have something reasonable there but it's taken 20 years to get there. So had a committee gotten together and said, let's create the lingua franca for the internet and decide on a bunch of things, they probably could have come up with something tremendously better than JavaScript. And people tried that. Dart is a great example of that. Google created it. And TypeScript is an example. And CoffeeScript is an example, either by a small group of people or a committee, didn't really matter. Big company, small company, bright engineers, average engineers. Nothing worked. So the first step in interoperability is just to say, well, what can we do on the science side and get for free? So we're working on something called sidechains. And what do sidechains do? Well, it's kind of an old concept, but it's a good concept. The basic idea is that you say, I have this chain out here. And if I get a transaction from that chain, I need to in some way verify two facts about that transaction. One is that the funds that I'm receiving have, uh, do exist. It's an existential proof. If you're sending me Litecoin and I'm Bitcoin, I need to know enough about the Litecoin chain to be able to make an assertion that the transaction you're sending me is from real money. It's from real Litecoin that's actually there in the system. You're not making it up. Second, even if it's real money, how do I know you didn't double spend? How do I know that you didn't create two transactions and send one to my chain and then one to Dash or to another system? So even though it's real money, you've doubled it and you've sent it one way or the other. So it's a non-existence of a double spend. 
These are the two facts that you must know to be able to actually validate a transaction like that. So does this require that chain to have special transaction types and addresses and these things? And the answer is maybe not. It just depends on your trust assumptions and it just depends on whether you want to do it in a completely decentralized way or you're willing to accept some degree of centralization. So we have a whole research stream that's saying, how much can we get for free with just the cryptography and clever application of concepts like zero knowledge proof and data structures and these types of things. Then once we've figured that out, the next step is saying, okay, how much does require changes to the underlying protocol and what incentives exist? And can we cheat a little bit and use a centralized or federated solution to enable pegging? And we're not the only ones in the space. There's the Interledger Committee at the W3C. There's over 300 members and it's maintained by Ripple. There's a lot of money they're putting into it. There's dedicated protocols like Aeon that have been created for this. And at the end of the day, if I solve it, great. If someone else solves it, even better. So I'm pragmatic. So the solution is just to adopt the market standard. And what we'll do is try to build as much science as we can so whatever the market standard ends up becoming, we can augment that standard with higher levels of assurance and security. And if it turns out that we end up solving the problem and the industry agrees, we'll just adopt it. But you have to be pragmatic here and accept, well, if it's JavaScript, it's JavaScript. We'll build TypeScript to make it better. Next question. Uh, let's see here. Microsoft bought GitHub. How does that impact IOHK? Yeah, you know, I've gotten this question a lot as if somehow Microsoft acquiring a company, you know, hurts us. So I would understand if you're a private firm who is a competitor of Microsoft, and all of your code was in a private repo on GitHub, that you would be maybe a little concerned that now Microsoft can read your source code. I, I get that. That's a very reasonable thing. My code is open. It's all open source. It's all for everybody to see. So it doesn't really matter that Microsoft happens to own the bucket that the code is stored in. We're using Git as the underlying technology. That's a decentralized protocol. So, okay, if they somehow delist our repo, we would still be using a VCS and we would still be developing software. So I, I think that's just irrational Microsoft derangement syndrome that, uh, that's propagated to the space. Much ado about nothing. IOHK website lists a lot of staff members that aren't directly employed by IOHK. How is the team growing? I don't really understand what that question means. How do you know what their employment status and relationship to IOHK is? Like, where did this question come from? This is great. Um, most of the people who are listed on our website work full time at our company in one way or another. Whether a contractor or an employee doesn't really matter. We operate in 16 countries. To do things completely right, I'd have to incorporate every damn country, and I really don't want to deal with that accounting nightmare. So sometimes people are contractors, but for the most part, the people on the website work for us. Now, there are cases where they don't work for us completely, like Phil Wadler, for example, because it makes a hell of a lot more sense for Phil to continue being a professor at University of Edinburgh and continue being one of the centerpieces of the Haskell ecosystem, because he kind of wrote the programming language. So why would we tell him to throw all of that away to go and do stuff for us? And the same for Agalos Kayasas. He manages the BTL for us. So he works part time, but certainly for us and no one else. Um, there are cases where there are some long term consultancies, like, for example, well typed won't let me buy them. So I just have to deal with them being contractors. But most of them work for us uh, full time. So I don't know what the point of this question was, but it's a strange question. Will governments stop crypto? They are probably happy with the current system. No, governments aren't happy with the current system. You know, there's no one in government who wakes up and says, boy, everything's going great. My life is amazing. You know, I don't have any problems. You know, it's, it's like unicorns and pixies. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to take the day off because no one's complaining. No, governments are, are creatures of misery and masochism. They're just, they're living in an endless spiral of horrible problems and being yelled at. No one likes them and they're just angry at the world. Why? Well, because you have a model 
and the model doesn't work, then everything changes. Technology changes, society changes, people change, opinions change, politicians change every few years. You go from George Bush to Barack Obama to Donald Trump. And, uh, and when these things happen, your life gets either easier or harder, but it's, uh, it's like the ocean. The waves go up, the waves go down. It ebbs and the flows. So governments are constantly having to think about, well, what's the future hold for us and how do we change how things work? One of the biggest problems governments have is that they only have two levers to pull to keep themselves alive. One is to raise taxes because they need tax revenue. And the other lever they can pull is the lever of inflation. And it's really tempting to pull the inflation lever. That one is just awesome because you don't raise taxes and you pretend like everything's okay, but you're printing money in the background and your debt goes up and up and up and up. Like America, we're at 21 trillion. I remember Bill Clinton was in office, we're at 4 trillion. We were all complaining about it. It's like, how could we have a debt this high? 18 years later, we're at five times higher and it's only getting worse. Same for Japan. It's getting so bad in Japan. They're like, they're trying to like look under people's floorboards for hidden gold. You know, these guys are getting pretty merciless with taxes. Well, you can talk to Dan about that. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, you only have two levers to pull, and uh, they pulled the inflation lever too much, and they sometimes can't even pull that lever. Greece is a great example of that. So Greece went from their own currency to the euro. Can they print more euros when they need more euros? No not really in control of that. So how do you print more money to pay your bills? You can't. Suddenly the economy collapsed. Oh no, not so good. So in a way, we're kind of stuck because we're becoming more global, more transnational. Trade is really weird. We're, we're having these deep interconnected economies where governments are not solely in control of their own people and their own domain. U.S. government didn't give me permission, nor can they stop me from coming here to Singapore to talk to you guys and do business abroad. And millions of Americans do that. And so you can try to dream up some massive transnational regulatory structure to pull everybody back into the US and watch everybody. And they've certainly tried to do that with FACA and these other things. God, my taxes are fun to file. Uh, but at the end of the day, more and more and more of what I do and my American colleagues do and you do, when especially when you go abroad, is not captured by the bureaucrats. And the things that I do don't just stay abroad, they come home. My money comes home, my ideas come home, my businesses come home and so forth. And the bureaucrat is the one who actually has to figure out how the hell do we put all of this together in a reasonable way. And they don't know how to. They don't know how to deal with transnational compliance or transnational environmental policy. Like they have this thing called the Paris Treaty. How the hell is that environmental treaty going to actually be enforced? You say, these are our carbon targets, and we're going to lower carbon consumption globally. I say, great, you got all these nations, even North Korea, to sign on. Huzzah. How do we know they're doing it? Who's responsible for that? How do you sort it out? Is it going to be an American agency? No, we pulled out. Is it going to be a European agency? Okay, great. You're going to get the South Americans on board with that? Huzzah. So this is the issue. You have transnational problems that are directly connected to local policy, business policy. So how do you track it? How do you regulate it? How do you think about it? The headache. Would you as a regulator want to be in charge of all of that and have to decide all these things? Oh, God, no. And meanwhile, these things cost time and money. You have a finite budget and they're running out of the inflation lever. They're killing the entire world financial system. And you can only raise taxes too high before your head's on a spike. So they need something different. They need new ways of identifying people. They need new ways of tracing flows of value. They need new ways of tracing accounting and compliance, and these types of things. And cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology seem like they're a really good potential candidate for a solution. The question is, how do they put it all together and who's going to be in control? And that's really the crux of our entire space is trying to figure out how do we build systems that are useful for everybody, which do not involve putting somebody in direct control. And if we do have a middleman, getting rid of the middleman of necessity, keeping the middleman of desire. What is a middleman of necessity? YouTube. We like it, we go there, we consume videos all the time, content producers create videos all the time. Nobody really likes YouTube being in control, especially if you've ever been demonetized. You say the wrong thing, you do the wrong thing, and suddenly you go from making millions of dollars to nothing because you pissed off a random algorithm or a person. And can you just quit and leave and say, screw you, YouTube? Well, yeah, you can, but they control the entire marketplace. 
So even if you leave, who's going to consume your content? No one. The same for Facebook, the same for Uber, the same for Airbnb. You have this oligarchy of middlemen of necessity. Governments are no different. So what's going to happen with our technology, the cryptocurrency space, is it gives us a nice tool bag to get rid of those actors. But we can keep some middlemen that are good. For example, reputation. Think about credit scoring, credit agencies. Do you like them? Well, if you're a bank, you sure as hell do. Because you have these customers that come to you and say, give me money. And you have no idea who these people are. And even if you did, you can't know everybody. So you have to make a decision. Do I give the person money or not? So if you have somebody who can stamp a number on their head, that makes that transaction a lot easier for you to deal with. So you can talk about decentralizing that, but at the end of the day, they're necessary for that transaction to be possible. Okay. So what this technology does is it gives governments more tools in their bag to sort out transnational relationships. It gives us more tools in our bag to get rid of people and actors we don't like. And it gives us more tools in our bag to deal with the fact that we can no longer print money as much as we used to and manage all of that and keep our economy stable and solvent because they're really not stable and solvent at the moment. It requires a huge amount of knowledge. It requires a huge amount of new tech, a lot of retooling. The good news is most of these paper-based economies already have to digitize. India is a great example of that. So if they're going to digitize anyway, it's just like when we went to phones. If you're Pakistan, do you put tons of copper wire in the ground or you just put up cell phone towers? You put up cell phone towers, you go with the best available new technology. And that's what we're seeing. I was just in Rwanda. We talked to the government there. They're incredibly keen to apply blockchain technology to their, um, to their uh, country. And everything from land registration to the business registration system to voting, they were very keen to have these conversations because they said this is best available new tech and we'd like to see what it can do. By the way, they also invited a lot of other countries to come. They invited Estonia to come because they have this whole e-governance platform, dozens of other people. And they were playing like the, uh, like the bachelorette. You know, they had the, the roses. They said, well, who are we gonna give the rose to? It was pretty cool actually. So good question. Everybody wants to work to make more money. Are you in the cryptocurrency space to make more money? No. In fact, I'm one of the crazy people in the space that, uh, for whatever reason, I've made very poor decisions. Uh, the greatest of which is I've never had any ether. I created Ethereum with a Vitalik. I never took ether. I was entitled to 293,000 ether. At the all-time high, it was over $500 million. Didn't get anything. So sort that out. Next question. <laughs> get the BP audience to ask some questions. That's a good, that's a good question. Yeah, why don't you guys ask something? You've been listening to me babble and uh, I've only been reading questions off here. Anybody in the audience have a question? Or are you asking questions on your cell phone? I don't know how the system works. It's terribly confusing. Okay, over there. Well, one question on Texas. Um, Texas. Um, in your discussions with governments, have you encountered some web global issue of taxing a successful digital and decentralized company, such as, uh, for example, let's say Golden Network takes off and is very successful, right. uh, puts a lot of on business. Who's going to get the opportunity to tax them? You don't tax the actual system, you tax the interface points with the system. Because at the end of the day, there's going to be people or businesses that are using this. And then there's consumption, and then there's going to be a tax that's applied there. So I feel at the consumer user points, there's going to be some of right. application. Yeah, because it changes taxation in a very foundational way. So our current tax systems rely on this notion of income knowledge. So the government has to know you well enough to know how much money you're making. And then once they know how much money you're making, they take a proportion of it. But you could tax in a different way. You could tax based on consumption. So if you go to the supermarket and buy something, the person selling you that candy bar has no idea how much money you make, but yet they can levy a tax on you, right? It's on a per transaction basis. Uh, and that system makes a lot more sense when you're talking about cryptocurrencies because it's gonna become really, really, really hard to know how much crypto I have or anybody else does. It was, oh yeah, we know about your Bitcoins. Like, what about my Zcash or my Monero? And these things are getting better, you know? And so, yeah, it's like an arms race. And it almost reminds me of the arms race we fought way back in the day with um, the RIAA and file sharing. They said, oh, we shut Napster down. Yeah, victory is ours. It's like, what about BitTorrent? Ooh, shit. 
And that's exactly what's happening here because it's going to become harder and harder to know how much money people have. The money's not touching any legacy financial infrastructure. So all your recording mechanisms you have, like suspicious activity reports and reporting requirements are gone. And if you harshly attack people and try to take their money and tax their assets, what they're going to do is just get more and more private, more and more hidden, and it's like an arms race. And so it makes much more sense to just go to the merchants and the endpoints and just say, we're going to have a national sales tax and charge you that. So we don't know how much money people make, but we'll just tax consumption. And, you know, that's a fair way of doing it. Also, philosophically, to me, it seems much more pure. We say the government is the custodian of the markets, a maintainer of the markets, and it's there for consumer protection and a litany of other things to prevent the externalities of the market. And therefore, they take a surcharge for that service they provide to us. Whereas an income tax says the government owns all of your money, and they're going to let you keep some of it based upon what's going on and who you happen to be. It's just a very different philosophy. And uh, it's, uh, it's a shame we lost that fight in the early 20th century. And the progressives inflicted this upon humanity. Um, I think income taxes are very immoral. Because at the end of the day, it's whoever has the best lobbyist. And at the end of the day, it's whoever has the best ability to hide that wins. Not, there's no e equality in that system. There's no fairness in that system. And then it's easily descends into mob rule. You end up getting these crazy haired people named Sanders run around and say, everybody needs to pay their fair share. I mean, how many fucking aircraft carriers do I need to buy for the US government before I pay my fair share? It's never enough. And then the rates never go down. I mean, yeah, they go down when you elect the right people, but then they go back up. And you know, look at it, the income tax when it first came out in America, it was 3% and 7%, I think were the two rates. Within 25 years, the top rate was 94%. And they were still talking about raising it. Huey Long wanted a 100% income tax rate for the highest bracket. Should, said you shouldn't make any money beyond that. So what did they do? They said, sure, we'll take the 94%. And they created exotic trusts and hundreds of deductions and all these structures. So the top rate looked high, but the really rich people found ways to not pay the tax. You know, in Greece and Italy, they're so good at evading taxes. It's like a national pastime, you know? I can't tell you how many Greek conversations I've had, because we have an office in Athens where I'm talking to Greek lawyers or other people, and 85% of our conversation is on evading taxes. And I didn't bring it up. They just start talking. They're like, oh, my God, I can't tell you this one deal we did. We ran through Cyprus, and we did this, and the Greek Orthodox Church was involved here, and then this guy's brother was involved. We're like, whoa. This is crazy. I need a whiteboard for this shit. This is this is unbelievable. You know why? Because they have crazy high, crazy stupid tax rates, and politically they can't change them. But then they create structures to evade them. It was the same in Italy with the Vatican Church. You know they would have very high tax rates. Oh yeah, rah rah socialism, and then people would wash their money through the through the church, and then in some cases they just put it all in their trunk and drive it up to Switzerland and hide it there. In fact, they had to put police on the border to search cars because so many people were driving cash across the border. So it just gives you a sense of that, how tax policy can be very bad. And I think what cryptocurrencies do is they give us a chance to actually create fair programmable transnational rules and actually make sure that governments get what they're due. And we can put them into the transaction itself and we can put them into the markets themselves. And then people can just agree to follow these things because the markets provide value to them. Is it perfect? No but it sure is held a lot better than what we have. And in America, we have a 600 to $800 billion fraud rate every year with income tax, where people owe money, but they just choose not to pay it. And the IRS it does a cost benefit analysis, and they realize the cost of trying to collect is more than the value of collecting. So they just let $800 billion of uncollected revenue sit on the sidelines of here. So when you go to a government, you have that conversation with them and say, look, it's a different system, but, it's a system where you'll get a much higher compliance rate and ultimately more money. Plus you benefit from transients. So people who come from abroad come to your country on vacation or to work for a bit, they are actually paying taxes now too, as opposed to the system we have right now, which is put a stamp on everybody's head and figure out everything about their life and then you know, try to force everybody to tattletale on them and figure out who's rich and who's not and then take as much as you can get. And then those people will hire the best lobbyists to change the law so they can create special structures to hide everything in. It's a game of cat and mouse. So I, I think it's just a much better system and it's a much more sensible system. And it's something that we can reach to in a rather quickly if we wanted to. Next question. Hi, Dennis. Uh, my name is 
Thanks for coming. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, my question to you is, uh, there are uh, a lot of companies that are conditioning on blockchain. Uh, is there a primary component in order to qualify? So, like, there are public blockchains I don't see them as really different things. I see them rather as different concepts living in the same web. Um, so if you think about it, uh, they're really like an exchange, for example. Right now, the exchange is in hell. If you run Coinbase or you run Bitstamp or Bittrex, you live in a reality where you get sent assets. And instead of those assets coming to a system where you control all the business logic, all the security, and all of the, the facts and circumstances that would allow you to maximize the protection and efficiency of that asset, it's being sent to an account that doesn't even know it's living on your exchange. So you're paying the worst of both worlds and the consumer is getting screwed and the exchange is getting screwed. The consumer does not benefit from this being on the cryptocurrency network. Why? Because they've already given the value to somebody else. So another person controls the private keys. So you can't make any argument about decentralization, you know, raw and raw network. It's at the end of the day, it's you've already handed all your power and control to somebody else and you're trusting that person. All you've done is rob that person of their ability to put in business logic to protect you. And to be very clever and dream up this hot cold wallet thing and all these procedures and policies which slow the business down and introduce additional cost to the business. Whereas if they had a bespoke system, they would be able to program right into the ledger of the system all those controls and be much more efficient. So that's where a permission ledger would come in. You'd do a sidechain transaction, you'd send it from a decentralized system to a centralized system the exchange controls. Now, as a consumer, you would still be able to verify and validate some things. And by the way, you'd be able to verify and validate them in much better ways than you can do right now. Because right now, it's all living on this flat network. When you send that Bitcoin from account A to account B, there's this stuff that lives off chain that the exchange is doing, the order books, the trading, and you just hope to God that that's right and it's fair and there's not front running and all this other bad stuff. It's not programmed into Bitcoin, nor will it ever be. It's living somewhere else and you're hoping the regulator keeps them honest. So that's terrible. But what if you had a permission ledger where not only could you get the benefit of it being controlled by the exchange, so they can build in consumer protections with it, but also in a transparent way, they can build in all of the standards that regulate the exchange. So you now know you're sending it to a full reserve. You now know you're sending it to a ledger that can't happen and so forth. Trading occurs, records are kept, and then when you're ready to withdraw, it goes from the centralized ledger to the decentralized ledger. And that's where I think we can live with harmony with the permission ledger and the permissionless ledger, is you have a situation where there are certain things that you really, really do want to do in a federated or centralized way because of the nature of that business or performance requirements. And also all of that stuff should not be on a global network where it's preserved forever. And there are certain things you want to do on a completely permissionless system. I'd argue land registration is a good example of that. because You really don't want people to screw with the ledger. Or at the very least, hashes or checkpoints of your registration should be put on a permissionless ledger. So the key here is understanding how the connection points work, how the deployments work, how the asset flows are going to work, these types of things, and then being able to verify that certain logics are maintained regardless of their permission or permissionless. Now, <coughs> there has been some good progress in the permission blockchain space. We've seen consortiums like R3 create Corda. Hyperledger actually has two flavors. There's Sawtooth and Fabric. They don't like each other as much as they should, uh, but they're both very innovative and they're doing great things. And uh, they brought a lot to the market. There's even smaller projects that are doing interesting things like Kadena, for example, which is a group of people who got tired of working for Chase and they took all the tech with them. They abandoned Project Juno and they created Kadena as their own little company and they're doing quite well and Tenderman and so forth. And we have our own ideas about enterprise blockchain. Uh, but the important part is it's all open source. And the important part is that when these things are deployed in real life settings, like IBM is deploying fabric in many scenarios, from supply chain management to global logistics and so forth, they tend to feed all of the knowledge that they've learned back into the system. And it's what we call the smart cow effect. 
you ever had cows, I got my boots on, I grew up in Colorado, cows, they're all in the pen, and then suddenly one of those cows gets really smart and figures out how to open up the gate. The cow opens the gate, and then all the cows escape. Does every cow need to be smart? No, just one cow, and then you lose all your cows. Well, the smart cow effect. It's also for DRM, right? Somebody breaks your digital rights management system, they figure out how to copy your music or your video game. Does everybody have to know how to do that? No, just one person, and then they can replicate it. And so it's the same situation with enterprise blockchain. The minute that one figures out how to solve a particular domain of a problem, whether that be financial inclusion or voting, it's now available to every single person in the entire space. That's the magic of our particular space. That's the power of the space is we're tackling very complex business problems that don't have obvious solutions or answers. And we're tackling them in a very open way. So once they've been solved, it's available for everybody to see. So that's, um, that's the other side of it. So I think they can live in harmony. I think that they both provide value and do interesting things. And I think the much more meaningful story is not whether permissioned or permissionless, it's about the connection points, the internet of blockchains. How are we gonna wire them together? How are we gonna move value between them? Under what conditions can we move value? When can your assets be frozen? Where do you lose privacy? Where do you gain privacy? Uh, these types of things. That is so much more important than the actual ledger itself because there's going to be hundreds of these types of things and there's going to be you know, lots of people deploying them for various things, myself and others. Next question. In the back. At you. Thanks for having me. And I like to imagine that you have pushed the ball because you, you've been in the past and, and the things you have done are quite revolutionary. And I want to hear your take on what's happening to countries now they've been issuing their own digital currency, a digital token. What, to your crystal ball, what do you see happening? Yeah. Thank you. So if you're China or Russia or the United States, um, you have enough sphere of influence and enough weapons that you can kind of force the world to do certain things and to be treated very fairly. If you're Madagascar or if you're Uganda or if you're Chile, you don't really have that kind of pull. So basically what you're told is whoever happens to be the sphere of influence your country exists within, uh, you're just going to have to, for the most part, adopt what they give you. And there is no greater evidence of that uh, the, the central banks of small countries, like Caribbean countries and so forth. Imagine living in a country where you're told you can't even do bilateral settlements. Imagine you're a central banker and you wake up and you say, I'd like to call up my next door neighbor, country right next to me, and do a swap with them. I'm going to print some money and they're going to print some money and we're going to swap it. That's a bilateral settlement. And somebody comes to you and says, no, you actually have to go through a third currency, the U.S. dollar, living far away. He said, but why? They said, that's just the way it works. Yeah. He said, but that's not fair. And then what if somebody says, uh, you know, you want to go do business with a particular country? And then somebody says, well, no, 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 the United States is not happy with that country. They've embargoed them. Said, but, but I have nothing to do with that conflict. I don't care that Cuba's pissed off the United States. I want to buy cigars. That would be nice. They said, no, 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 I'm so sorry. He said, oh, shit. So what the central bank issuance of digital assets is doing is this broader conversation of how do we de-dollarize and remove American hegemony? That's really what they're saying when they're thinking about these things. That's, that's the big conversation of how do we build a system where geopolitics can't be introduced into the world financial system such that if you piss off the wrong big player, your country can basically be excommunicated from the League of Nations. You're, you've been given, uh, you know, your own uh, your own autonomy. There is no greater example of this than banks with corresponding bank relationships. I have a lot of friends in cryptocurrency business. They come and they say, God, I'm having such a hard time getting a bank account or in the Isle of Man or Gibraltar or someplace. And they set up there, they're full compliance, fully regulated. They, they know the prime minister on a first name basis. Then they go into the bank and they say, okay, I got the license. I got everything. The government's cool with me. And the bank says, no account. And they say, but the government's not going to come after you. And they say, you know, we're not worried about the central bank or the government. No, no, no. We're worried about correspondent relationships because we have to be able to send value out of the country and somebody has to route that. And if we piss those people off, we're just like you, man. We get cut off. So 
So they think a lot of times about that logic there and how these things are interconnected. Uh, so if you issue your own digital token and settlement doesn't have to go on these systems, kind of like Tether, for example, then you actually don't need correspondent banks. You have a direct relationship with your customers. And it's the same at the nation state level. You don't actually need permission to trade with people or fear you know, embargoes and things. You just evade them. So at the nation state level, they are thinking about how do we introduce this technology in a way through federation that we can gradually de-dollarize and remove this whole world reserve currency uh, set up. That's a very dangerous idea. And so people have to be very careful with what they're saying and what they're doing. But if you read between the lines and you talk to these guys and you kind of, you know, like sacrifice the chicken and wear the black robes at night and just, you know, go to the secret meeting. That's basically what they're saying when you remove all the jargon and the bullshit. It's, we don't like the way the world system works. We understand why it works this way. It was created because it was either the Americans or the Soviets, but that's gone. And we live in a new world. We have the internet. We're adults. Let's have a financial system that's like email as opposed to a financial system that's like pipes moving oil around. It's crazy. Uh, and so one of the components of that is being able to digitize money and have it run on a different settlement system and be able to flow directly to the consumer as opposed to going through intermediaries that you don't control or can't regulate. And there's no coincidence that we see things like the Petro, for example, in Venezuela and so forth, uh, right at the same time when they're facing international sanction and other problems, right? So there's a direct correlation there. And what's the long-term consequences? I have no idea. You know, it's, um, it's not even clear what the US policy is. It's kind of funny, we, we thought we knew. You know, we talked to people from the State Department and we had a pretty good sense of what was going on and that was Rex Tillerson and then he got fired and now there's a new guy. And we're not sure what this guy thinks. <laughs> and maybe he'll get fired. So if, we don't, you know, if you don't like the current policy, just wait about six months to a year, the guy running it will be fired. And that's the way it's gonna be for a while, tragically. But a levity aside, it's a very complicated issue and the world is now no longer monopolar, um, and not even bipolar, it's multipolar and there's lots of wells of power. And small countries are quickly realizing that this technology can introduce some symmetry into their trading relationships, which are traditionally asymmetrical. And it's really gonna benefit Mauritius and Singapore and Switzerland and all these guys who tend to get shafted. It's not gonna be so good for the United States and Russia and China. Next question. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is uh, your good buddy, uh, Vitalik, Vitalik, uh, Oh, Vitalik uh, Peter? Yeah, okay. recently he made a very uh, interesting comment. He said his exact words are, I definitely hope centralized exchanges go for in hell as well. <laughs> so, do you agree <laughs> and why? Uh, my second question is, when can I escape Cardano with my uh, laser device? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. So for the first question, um, there is an uneasy relationship between those who maintain and propagate cryptocurrencies and those who maintain the infrastructure to trade them. Um, back in the day, it was a symbiotic relationship where we agreed in mutual value and uh, we'd work together. But what's increasingly happened is exchanges realize they're kingmakers and can make big decisions for the space. And there's some of them are even charging five to $10 million listing fees for a token. Just to get your token on the exchange, you have to pay $10 million of your project money. So I can understand Vitalik's pain. I feel his pain, like Bill Clinton level, feel his pain all the way down. Uh, and I share his frustration in many, many, many cases. Strange, strange conversations, incredibly schizophrenic policy, poor security. Uh, very uncooperative developers where you say, hey, there's a security enhancement, can you guys upgrade? And they say no, and then they get hacked or something breaks, and then they blame you for it. It's extremely difficult, and it's because the space is run by younger entrepreneurs as opposed to established professional businesses. It's getting better, and some people are much better than others. I really like Binance, for example. They're pretty easy to work with, and they've been nothing but nice to us. But I understand the sentiment. So, What's going to happen? Well, competition will happen because bigger guys are getting involved. Traditional actors are getting involved and uh, the industry is getting more professionalized and tighter regulation is coming. So we'll get more uniformity and fairness in the treatment of tokens. So that's one dimension that will make that burn and hell comment just maybe a little bit more muted. 
But there's also competition from decentralized exchange. So if you're going crypto to crypto, this can already be done really well. If you're going crypto to fiat, you need a digital representation of fiat. That's what Tether is effectively attempting to do, and it's had a modicum of success. Over time, um, every person is going to be putting a, a, a stone in that mosaic, and eventually we will have a, a viable decentralized exchange system. And at that point, then exchanges really have to be adding value to the transaction. And if they don't, well, then they'll go extinct. So I think it's some combination of increasing professionalism and better regulation combined with more competition, both from other exchanges as well as decentralization, that will improve the situation. In the meantime, we're all in hell together, and it, you know it's pretty bad. In terms of staking, our best bet is Q1 or 2019. We're hoping for that. Maybe sooner, maybe later, but we're working really, really fucking hard on it. And I keep hiring people and keep pushing people, and um, it's it's tough. Um, it's tough for a variety of reasons. It's tough because Ouroboros is a completely new protocol. It's tough because we have to write a lot of code and think very deeply and carefully about things. It's tough because there's no guidebook on how to handle the economic side and the incentive side and the delegation side, and we've had to invent a lot of new things. And it's uh, it almost reminds me of a friend of mine. He ran the Boston Marathon once, and uh, he trained for it for a long time. I remember seeing him every day I, near, near the same office, and he'd go running. And I'd say, Bill, that looks great. And uh, he went and ran it, and it was about 90% of the way through the marathon. He was making great time. And then suddenly he had a really upset stomach and he realized he had to go to the bathroom and he's like oh god what do i do i don't know i'm gonna go finish the race and he said you know what I'm just gonna go for it and shit just started coming up down his leg and he came in to make great time and go and hug his wife and she's like oh god what happened and he said you know sometimes you just gotta shit while you run <laughs> so anyway the moral of the story is we're gonna to have to shit while we run with Cardano. <laughs> Just make it work. And that's okay, because uh, we'll still make good time. And uh, I think you guys will be pretty happy. Next question. <laughs> Sorry for the metal picture. I hope everybody already ate. <laughs> <laughs> that's how we're gonna end it, huh? <laughs> yes, sir. Right. So you, you have a collection of professionals, you have domain experts, legal professionals, regulators, and what they do is they kind of come to a consensus of what the agreement needs to look like. So the, the heart and soul of the agreement, the intent of the agreement. Then there's the execution of the agreement. So generally this is done by paper and people. That's what you would see. You write it into a contract. You write it into a policy, you model it as a business process, whatever it might be, you put it down on paper, and then you go and train a bunch of people and you hope to God they understand what you've actually told them to do and they go and do it. Then you look at the output and then you see, is it what I wanted or is there something else happened? And if it's not what I wanted, uh, there's some remediation, you sue people, you change the deal, these things. So that's a well understood process. It's been around for quite a long time. I collect clay tablets from Babylon there's apparently grain contracts on them. I can't read Babylonian or whatever the hell the language is. So maybe they spoke Aramaic. I'd have to look it up. But I assume that they're grain contracts. But at some point, somebody had to carve that into the tablet, right? Okay, so what smart contracts are, are a way of saying, okay, well, after we've decided what we want to do, it's a way of modeling what we want to do and then handing a lot of the enforcement and handing a lot of the facts and circumstances to machines instead of people. It's automation, okay? It does not substitute the getting into the room with the lawyers and the business experts and the domain experts and making decisions about intent. It's just a way of then modeling intent so that computers can understand that. And in the process of doing it, you get standardization. Because what's gonna end up happening is BP looks a lot like ExxonMobil. And you guys look a lot like other companies, right? And you kind of do the same thing. They have your own flavor and obviously BP is the best company and so forth. but Every now and then, you guys may be doing something very similar. And so would it be a tragedy if Exxon Global spent $500 million figuring out a best practice for something for that to stay within their company as opposed to being encapsulated into code that you then could borrow and not have to reinvest that money? 
or vice versa. And that's the power of smart contracts is that when you start looking at all these processes which get modeled, eventually you're going to start discovering overlaps and commonality and best practices. And then you're going to start looking at library driven companies. You know, it's just like when people wrote proprietary code and they all had their own repos, and they all had their own stuff going on. And then the open source revolution comes in and everybody says, well, hang on a second here. We're all kind of doing the same thing. Why the, why the hell are we writing it again 12 times? Let's just make it open source and then we'll just all draw from that well. Now, the danger there is with the gain deficiency, problems can cascade. So if there's a flaw, it's not just Exxon's flaw, it's your flaw, right? Okay, so there lies the problem. How do we make sure that the intent matches the code and that this is actually a good idea? So the first question of does the intent match the code is called the semantic gap. How do you bridge that? There's some great papers uh, from Chris Clack uh, on smart contract templates that talk about this. We talk about this with Plutus, uh, but it is a complicated topic and there's a lot of work that needs to be done to close that. Then the, is it a good idea? The only way you know that is through market competition and efficiency. You run it, you see if it works, right? And eventually it'll, it'll uh, get to where it needs to go. Now, the key there is simplicity. You know, the simpler it is, the easier it is to understand, the easier it is to find the mistakes. That was the big problem with financial engineering was that it was neither simple nor transparent. We built these insanely complicated financial instruments that nobody fully understood. And we thought we understood it as a society and then realized that we didn't and everything came crashing down. So that's the other side of it is that you need to embrace modularity, you need to embrace simplicity, but that's part of the best practices of the design process. And the whole notion of smart contract allows you to start talking about that. You say, oh, but Charles, will this really make things simpler? Can you give me one example of where that would make sense and how that would be better? Say, sure, I'll give you a great example. It's when every exchange, going back to our favorite burn and hell example, let's say you run an exchange, Charles Exchange, the best exchange in the world. So how does it work? Okay, so somebody wants to create an account with me. Let's say you do. So I say, okay, great. Give me your passport, the utility bill, and all that money you sent me. Let's see, origin of funds on it. I have to spend a lot of money and time and effort to go ahead and figure out who the hell you are. Then, after I've done that, you go and trade. Oh, but I noticed the pattern. It looks a little weird. I got to go talk to my compliance officer. You're going to be my compliance officer. And you come back and you say, Charles, I think we got to file a suspicious activity report. Yeah, guess we got to do it. Yeah, we like being regulated. Uh, so we file it. We've just tattletailed on you to the IRS, which is some other regulatory virus. So sorry, did we tell you that we did that? No, we just did it secretly. So sorry. Good luck. That's the current relationship. That's how it runs. Now, what if we do something a little different? What if instead you take your data and you put it into a data warehouse? Okay, maybe it's decentralized, maybe it's centralized, but you put it into a warehouse. And then somebody attests that. Maybe your government signs your passport. Maybe your university signs your diploma. There's attesters that verify the validity of the data within that warehouse. Now I run my exchange. Instead of me collecting a portfolio on you, you try to send a transaction to me. And guess what I can automate? It's a contingent settlement transaction. You send it to me, it's sitting in pending. It's not doing. And what I do is I look up and I say, okay, well, where the hell are you from? Singapore, ah. Look up the Singapore library of required questions to clear this transaction. I pull it right off the shelf. And I start querying that data warehouse with zero knowledge queries. And I say, is he over 21? Is he a US citizen? Did he pay taxes on the money? And these are yes, no answers. And I get all these answers and eventually I keep going until either I reject the transaction or I approve the transaction. And if I approve it, now your funds are sitting here. Now, you, the consumer, sent this to me, and we're doing all of this in real time, and it's already all been programmed up, and those libraries are all programmed up, and they're contingent on the country, so you might be in a different country, like the UK, and you might be in China, and you might be in the United States. Four transactions come in from four different places. I don't know what the regulations are. I'm just pulling the questions that the regulators themselves wrote, and I run some logic as a smart contract, and it keeps going and going until you do the transaction settles and clears, and it's good or it fails, and the, you, the consumer, know there was a problem, I, the business, know there was a problem, and we can kind of figure it out. Maybe you had an incomplete profile. You chose not to put enough information in the warehouse to be able to do business with me. And that's for you to figure out as the consumer. It's not my problem. Do I have a compliance officer now? No. I'm just pulling it from the libraries the government gave me. 
Can the government come after me and say, give me all the data you have on this guy? I, go, I don't know that guy. Never mind. I have no idea who he is. I just ask questions if I'm allowed to do business with him or not. That's the world we can move to with a smart contract. You go from an office in a company that is a quarter to a third of your entire operating capital. You go from having a data custodial risk where you possess huge amounts of personally identifiable information on all of your customers that if you ever get hacked, you're liable for that. And you go from the regulator, you, the exchange, have to tattletale on your customer to having none of these things and they're all automated. And the regulator has much more control now. Why? Because at any time they can add more questions. And if he wants to do business, he then has to increase the size of his portfolio to do business with that. But that's not my concern as the operator of that business. So that's where I think smart contracts add true value to the process is this idea of zero knowledge querying it is a saying, I have an existing process that's not working for anybody. I, the exchange, am spending too much money and I'm not remunerated by the government. And I have to actually blacklist customers on jurisdictions that are just too expensive to do business with. We're seeing this in banking with U.S. customers. I try to open up a bank account. They look at me and say, United States, no way, no how. Because it's just not worth their time to deal with the compliance cost of it. So it's not working for the bank or the exchange. Is it working for you, the compliance officer? No, because at the end of the day, you want the business to succeed, but then as the compliance officer, you're having to be overly conservative and make decisions to cover your own ass and cover the business's legal risk at the expense of the relationship with the customer. And as a consequence, it makes the business less competitive and less profitable. And it's not working for you, the customer, because you never get clarity on whether you have a proper commercial relationship with the entity. Furthermore, it takes lots of effort, replicated effort for you. What if you're a day trader and you want to be on 12 different exchanges? You have to replicate that entire KYC and ML process on one exchange after another exchange after another exchange. And sometimes you have to wait months. For example, when ADA got listed on Bittrex, a lot of people try to create accounts to trade. And Bittrex's compliance office was so overloaded because it was right during the surge of cryptocurrencies, some people had to wait three months to clear compliance. For one customer, one exchange. And that has to be replicated by 12. So it's not working for him. So that's a system, legacy and paper, it's not working for anybody. And there's an alternative system where it works for everybody and it's considerably better. Going back to the tax example we talked about much earlier. Well, we can put taxes into that transaction as well and say, well, this thing is only going to settle if whatever profits he makes from that entry point get taxed back to the country of origin, 5% or 10% or whatever that is. That's pre-built into the transaction. There's a hook in the smart contract for it that comes from the library. And me as the vendor, I make that decision to include it. It's an old transaction. Just that simple. So you get tax compliance, you get automation, you have better, much more granular control with the government. You have a unified source of data by protected warehousing. It can be federated. You have all kinds of ways to attest the data and you have tons of automation. And that's an example of what a smart contract can do in an industry where collectively they spend every three years the value of Tokyo. $500 billion a year is how much financial institutions spend on average for compliance. Tokyo is worth about 1.5 trillion. Every three years, you could buy Tokyo for the cost of compliance. Think about that. And we just gave an example where you go from that to almost nothing. I'm sorry for the millions of people who lose their jobs who are in compliance right now. It kind of sucks. But you know, a lot of people lost their jobs because we no longer needed as many horses. We didn't cry. We just moved on. Next question. Thanks, Charles. Um, how do you see credit working where you wouldn't have credit for it based on banks trying to make their own pay? No, no, that's not true. There's so peer to peer credit. There's tons of that. There's Lending Club and Cuba. And there's increasingly larger and larger amount of money coming from peer to peer credit, from pawn shops, from Lending Club, you know, all these agencies. Does that work for those like one bank and have one for one asset? They have like $10,000. Sure. The whole fractional reserve versus full reserve banking question, right? Look, man, we've been having that fight for over 200 years. It's not going to go anywhere. There's a group of people, economically uh, speaking, the Austrian group, 
that says fractional reserve only results in one outcome, the destruction of the economy, because it's too tempting to just create money out of thin air. The Keynesians and more reasonable economists say, well, there are many cases if it's properly controlled where it does provide huge value to society. And the truth is probably somewhere in between. It's not a question of full or fractional, I think it's a question of competition. At the end of the day, the banks do have utility and purpose. <laughs> if you're talking about complicated transactions that are involving many actors and billions of dollars, this will never be done by just one person. It's gonna be done by professionals and there's gonna be people involved in that. It's more of a question of <laughs> like that coffee example that I gave where you've got a guy 20 miles north of Addis who's got three hectares of land and he says, I have a business proposition for you. Give me $250, I'll stump half my trees and in three years you get half the excess yield from that. That's a direct relationship between you and that farmer. It's an impossible transaction right now. But if we build things the right way, it becomes a possible transaction. Now, that's the peer to peer side of things. It's full reserve, but you still can make it somewhat fractional. You know, people can come by and start buying up all of these things and securitizing them, creating a whole portfolio of stumps. And then we can create derivatives on top of that and all kinds of financial products. That's exactly what this book is going to happen. You know, it's just like mortgages. You know, so you'd lend out some money and banks say, well, I want to keep lending. And, I'm locked and trapped in this relationship. Can I sell the mortgage to somebody else who wants to take this, you know, the certainty and then I can go and do something else with the capital? So we created a secondary market, right? And the exact same thing would happen with microfinance or insurance policies or other things. So I think it's just more about saying, can we build enough capabilities where capital can now flow into new ways? By the way, there's also other types of liquidity that are really nice to have that are seldom discussed. Let's say you run a pharmaceutical company. What do pharmaceutical companies have? Intellectual property, enormous amounts of it. And a lot of their IP is useless for the moment. But every now and then, you know, somebody discovers that apparently that thing that wasn't so good at treating blood pressure gives you an erection and voila, you have Viagra, drug of the century. So wouldn't it be so cool if you could take that locked up asset and you can tokenize that locked up asset, you can securitize it and say, look, we don't know when it's gonna strike, when lightning's gonna hit, but when it does, if you own a token for this portfolio of IP, uh, you'll get a cut of the windfall profits that are made from that. And on average, you know, something in that portfolio is gonna strike if I'm Pfizer or Bristol or any of these other guys. So you take something that was previously an asset worth billions of dollars, but illiquid, and now you've made that asset liquid. That's an example of what this token economy is introducing. Now, does it matter if all the dollars flowing into that relationship were generated from fractional reserve or full reserve? I mean, that's an economic argument. But what matters is that these markets now exist. They're here and we can create them. And it doesn't just work at the scale of Pfizer. It works all the way down to that IP startup that uh, professor it has 10 graduate students who discovered a really interesting thing but it's gonna take 10 years for that interesting thing to turn from an idea into an FDA approved drug. And under the current model, they have to go to predatory venture capitalists or drug companies and beg for capital to keep them running until they strike it rich. And when they do, then they get the acquisition and the windfall, but nine out of 10 fail before they get there. And now they have a new mechanism to allow them to have some competition in that funding source. Okay, and that can be a loan, it can be a bond, it can be a securitization, all of these types of things. And it can be completely peer to peer. The ICO is a great example of transforming venture capital. In the olden days, which were just a few years ago, it was so long ago, and I was skinny, I'm fat. In the olden days, if you want to venture capital, you had to win the geographic lottery. You know, if you were born in some poor village in India, there was no way in hell that you'd be able to go to Silicon Valley or these places and statistically be able to raise money. You somehow have to find a way to know the right people, somehow have to find a way to get to the right place, somehow have to find a way to then network into the VCs and pitch them this idea and take you 10 to 15 years probably to claw and scratch your way into that circle. Now, you can just pitch the idea to the world and the world will listen. When I was in Ethiopia, I was pitched at Blue Moon this great idea with an ag tech venture, these very entrepreneurial kids who created a cell phone app to connect farmers to restaurants. 
from soil to the dinner plate. It was an amazing concept, and it was amazing how quickly they grew. So let's say you're running some restaurant audits, and you say, I need 200 pounds of carrots for tonight. You can just go on the app, and it's almost like Uber, and you say, I need 200 pounds of carrots, and three or four different farmers can fill it. They just show up. You buy right from that. No supermarket, no middleman. Now, that business, because of its nature and the dynamics, is probably never going to you know, become as big as Uber or Airbnb. And that's fine. But it still could be a wildly profitable business for me to invest into. And the current way Ethiopia is structured, there's just no feasible way for that to happen. But this new economy, it does exist. There's now ways to monetize that business, to create some sort of model that it can tokenize it and then I can benefit from that, especially when we can securitize such things. And that's what I talk about when I talk about the token economy, is this concept of you can go from the smallest, poorest ventures in the world to these massive multinational deals, and they're both playing by the same protocols, the same sets of business logic, and the same rules. Never in human history have we ever had that. And as for the creation of money, it's opinionated. It's all fantasy. People make up money. The dollar doesn't actually exist, nor does the euro. It's just made up. We agree to believe in it. So once you've created such a system, you can create your own money, as we have done. And some people will believe the money we've created is better than the money the U.S. government has created. And other people will believe the money the U.S. government created is better than our money. And the truth is probably somewhere in between. The difference is, though, that now you, as the consumer, can make a decision of which one makes sense to you and then where to put that. And instead of having to put it locally or go through Wall Street and have them figure it out for you, you can now have a direct relationship with the people and the entities that you put that money into. It's a very exciting new time. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, Charles. Thanks for coming to Singapore. Really excited to have you here. Singapore has a very big crypto community. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, my question is, what is your view on the current ICO space and in terms of especially about the more and more new public blockchain coming out. Like every month, we have new public blockchain saying that they can solve the scalability issue and they are much better than email. And yeah, a million transactions per second. Yeah. Yeah. So, what's the Do we really need that many public blockchain? Like, even if we can solve the interoperability issue, do we really need that many public blockchain? Or we will actually end up with probably like 10 or even less than 10 blockchain that's going to be commonly used. Like, probably just, you know, Cardano, Ethereum, right. EOS. <laughs> I thought this would help. Yeah, what's your view on this? You know, um, Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan they had these legendary conversations, and one of which was Reagan asked uh, Gorbachev a little bit later, before he got Alzheimer's, uh, you know, when did you know the Soviet Union was going to collapse? Like, what was your epiphany? Because you know, Gorbachev was one of the first guys to kind of realize that, not publicly, but privately. He sure as hell knew that the writing was on the wall. And he said, you know, I visited America in the 70s, and I went to a supermarket. And we have supermarkets in the Soviet Union. We go to the American supermarket, and it was just like day and night. And in the Soviet supermarket, you just you have one thing for everything, right? And that's, that's the thing. You go to the American market, you have 500 types of cereal. It's like, who the hell is Count Chocula, and why does he have three flavors? This is crazy. And he just dawned on him that this system of choice cannot be defeated by a system of centralized control. So there are consequences to choice, terrible consequences to choice. If you go to the Caribbean, there's some islands out there where they have what's called plastic tide, where you'll see plastic just flowing on the shores. And it's just really saddening and sickening to see how much waste that we have. Go to India, there's whole mountains of garbage, e-waste and other things that are poisoning the river. Same in China. So while choice, gives you more options, you're more competitive, you can do more things. It's also tremendously wasteful. It means you lose a lot of money uh, and you lose a lot of productivity because not everybody's going to be aware. There are over 1,500 cryptocurrencies and the vast majority of these cryptocurrencies will fail. And the vast majority of money that's spent on trying to bolster these ecosystems and fund these teams will fail. And there was a recent report, I think it was Coin Operated Economy, it came out of the University of Pennsylvania School of Law, four authors, and about 100 pages. The TLDR of it is about 75%, three-fourths of ICOs are in some way fraudulent. 
fraudulent being defined as what people were told they were getting is different from what they actually got when they looked at the code and they actually looked at how the token mechanics worked. So does that then mean our space is bad? And that's the hard part. On one hand, by having choice and by having diversity and allowing people the freedom to go and do things, you usually end up creating models which are much stronger than the ones where somebody decides that on your behalf. On the other hand, you end up having plastic tied with it. And this is the financial equivalent of that. Uh, and I think the truth is probably that it's better to have choice. I've thought about it for a long time. Like where should the regulator get involved and how do we resolve this and so forth. But I also think that there's room for self-regulation in the industry and we do it at IOHK. I make scientific claims all the time. I say Ouroboros is provably secure. That's a very serious statement. It's not just a made up marketing word. It's an actual statement in the cryptographic literature and it has a standard. You have to an adversary, a model, assumptions, and mathematical proofs to show that it's secure. And then that standard has over 20 years old. Okay. I say that my code works. That's another very serious statement. So I have, the burden is on me as a project to follow some sort of process where I have a high degree of assurance. For example, when we created the Mantis client for Ethereum Classic, we wrote it from scratch, 100% new code, it's all in Scala. And we said, you know, I love my engineers, I trust them, but we need to audit the code. So we went to Kodelsky Security, we had them write an audit report and published it publicly. They did find problems in the code, we had to fix them. But we felt that these self standards were necessary. And that's what's gonna probably happen in the industry is people are making very crazy claims, scientific claims, performance claims, engineering claims, security claims, adoption claims. And we should be talking less about whether should they have the right to make those claims or not, or you know, should they have the right to do an ICO or not? And more about how can we as an industry develop standards so that we can find a way to verify that these claims are true. Just like we're starting to move to recycle plastic, and just like we're starting to move to fair trade and sustainable practices. It's dampering the externalities that these markets have. Similarly, we as an industry can self-regulate. In some cases, enshrine that regulation into smart contracts. Not always, but in some cases we can, especially when we're making promises about investing and distributions and these types of things. And at the end of the day, you also have to understand that failure is okay. The greatest failure in the tech industry was probably Netscape. It failed as a commercial entity, yet it gave us the modern internet. It defined what is the web browser, it created the certificate, the cookie, and JavaScript. Everything that we built in the web is probably in some way influenced or controlled by this one company, but yet it was a commercial failure, yet as a concept was a tremendous success. And in 90% of the time, startups fail. Now, we, with probably a degree of wisdom, have made decisions to insulate retail investors from that failure and say only the rich can play, but we're becoming a more egalitarian world. And even the Securities Exchange Commission recognized that with the Jobs Act, and uh, they've been given a mandate to try to democratize access to capital a bit more. And that's exactly what's happening now. For the first time ever, people are making bets on new economic systems, and they're not qualified to make those bets, but I'm not qualified to make those bets, nor are you because they're too complicated. There's too many things involved. No one can know the entire puzzle. Just like in 1976, if a 19 year old Bill Gates showed up at your office and said, give me money for this crazy Microsoft thing, you would look at him like, who the hell are you and why do you smell so bad? Yet that man ended up becoming the world's richest person and defining basically how the entire computer industry was going to work for decades, right? So sometimes you don't know. So what you do is you stick to your principles, you find ways to validate claims because you can sort fact from fiction there, you create industry standards to dampen things, and you embrace choice. Many will fail, and some failures will be unmitigated disasters like long-term capital was, and other failures will be like Netscape where they provide enormous value to the space, if anything, what not to do, and the good ones will float to the top. Now, does this mean you're gonna make money? No. In fact, statistically, you'll lose money. And then welcome to betting on venture capital. It's, a, it's not a good game. It's like the old saying is, what's the easiest way to be a millionaire? Start an airline as a billionaire. You'll, you'll lose enough money to become a millionaire eventually. And it's the same deal with investing. You know, what's the easiest way to be a millionaire? 
the modern day equivalent is probably put it into venture capital because you'll probably lose more than you gain. But every now and then you get a Google and uh, every now and then you get an Intel and so forth. And so I think we'll sort it all out. Anyway, thank you guys so much for your time. This was a heck of a lot of fun. I really enjoyed this and uh, I hope to do this again sometime. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you.